Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Patrick Canty and I'm publisher of the Odessa American. And, and again, it's my great privilege to be hosting this roundtable discussion um, that is being uh, hosted by Ravi Shakamuri and Star Hospice. Uh, this is the fourth in the series where we talk to, to physicians and healthcare professionals. In, in this case, we have physicians and two nurses tonight. Uh, and we talk about the effect of the pandemic and and try to answer questions from, from both me, myself, and from you in the audience uh, that you might have as far as, you know, uh, what's going on with this virus and, and how, you know, how it affects us and how we can stay safe. So, so um, it, I really appreciate uh, Ravi doing this. Ravi uh, started the Star Care uh, back in, I think it's the 90s, uh, and they serve a, a large area of West Texas. And so they, they do a, a, an incredible job. And this is a, is a wonderful program that, that Ravi decided we needed to do, and, and it's been well received. Uh, tonight, our topic is going to be COVID-19 and its effect on, on kidney patients uh, and, and, you know, issues dealing with COVID-19 and kidney failure, kidney transplants and, and, and the like. Uh, and we have a wonderful panel joining us here uh, to have this discussion. Uh, first off, and I'd like to introduce them. Um, they're, they're wonderful people. First off, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Anand Reddy. Uh, Dr. Reddy, this is, uh, has joined us for, uh, I think, all four of these. No, or three, three, of the four, three, three of the four. Three. And he's been wonderful. He, uh, Dr. Reddy is a board certified uh, physician in internal medicine and specializes as a board certified nephrologist. Uh, he's trained uh, in the UK and in this country. He's a member of the Royal College of Physicians. Um, Dr. Reddy's been practicing for over nine years in six locations across South Texas. And I think he, he that's what he brings to the table, I think, is he, he deals with this not only in, in city uh, settings, but also in rural settings. So he brings a lot of perspective on that. Um, in addition to, to his duties there, he's also a clinical associate professor at the Texas Tech Health Sciences Center of the Permian Basin. And he's a director of the Permian Basin and Kidney Center. Uh, he's been recognized with the Service Excellence Award for Core Value and Service by the uh, DeVita Physicians Leadership Group. Um, Dr. Reddy is uh, originally from Bangalore, India, but he's been here a long time, so he's pretty much a West Texas native in my book. So welcome, doctor. Next, we Thank have you. Dr. Uh, Asif Ansari, and Dr. Ansari is a, a board-certified uh, physician in internal medicine and also specializes as a board-certified nephrologist. Um, he studied in prestigious universities and hospitals in the United Kingdom and then the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Ohio. Um, he did that and then he moved here to West Texas. Uh, and he's a graduate of the Rajiv yeah. University in India in, in 2002. Uh, he's a member of the Royal College of Physicians in the United Kingdom and is also a fellow of the American College of Physicians and fellow of American Society of Nephrologists. Uh, he is actively involved in research and uh, on the editorial board of medical journals. Uh, he basically handles the patients both in Midland and Odessa for the hospitals and also takes patients from as far away as San Angelo. So welcome, doctor. Glad you're here. Thank you. Then we have uh, Dr. Sridhar Alam from Fort Worth. Uh, Dr. Alam is board certified in internal medicine and nephrology. Currently, he serves as a medical director of kidney and pancreas transplantation at Medical City Fort Worth Hospital at the Transplant Institute there. Uh, he's also an associate professor of medicine at Texas Christian University and University of North Texas Health Science Center School of Medicine. Dr. Alam received his MBBS at Andhar uh, Medical College in India. He then earned his master's in public health at UT Health Science Center in Houston. After his stint there at the Health Science Center, Dr. Alam completed his internal medicine residency uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, also in Ohio and moved to New York City to complete his nephrology fellowship and transplant nephrology fellowship at I Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Uh, doctor, welcome. We're glad you're here, uh, zooming in from Fort Worth. Appreciate you. Thank you Next, we have our, our nurses. Uh, and, and, and these two women are, are really something. Uh, they, they are 
when you talk about the front line, they're about as front line as you can get uh, dealing with these patients day in and day out. And it's first, I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Sylvia Aguilar. Uh, she's a Bachelor of Science in Nursing and a registered nurse. She's also cl a clinical coordinator uh, for medical, uh, Midland Memorial Hospital and Odessa Regional Medical Center and Encompass Rehab. She's been working as a dialysis nurse for 11 years. Uh, that's four years in the clinical chronic setting, and then seven years in the clinical acute hospital setting, which I'm sure she sees a lot of right now. Um, she works for all the nephrologists in the Midland Odessa area with acutes. Um, let's see, she's hometown, went to Odessa College, correct? And yes. uh, for your RN, and then you received your uh, bachelor's of science in nursing uh, from uh, UT uh, Arlington. Dialysis is always, she says, dialysis has always been my calling and I strive to do all I can for the dialysis patients to have a safe and effective treatment. Welcome, Sylvia, we're glad you're here. Thank you, thank uh, you. And then that brings me to Ms. Cindy Velasco and she is uh, the inpatient acute dialysis program manager at both Medical Center Hospital and Midland Memorial Hospital. Uh, Cindy's been a nurse for 15 years. She, she graduated uh, from Universidad de Santa Isabel, Santa Isabel in Naga City, Philippines in 2005 with a bachelor's degree and has been a nurse now, uh, let's see, for three years she worked as a medical and surgical nurse and had some ICU and dialysis experience in one of the prestigious hospitals in the Philippines. Uh, th th she then immigrated to the U.S. Uh, in 2009 and has been working as a dialysis nurse for Frenicius Kidney Care for the past 11 years. Uh, she's been appointed as the inpatient program manager uh, in 2014 and has been managing uh, basically the, the Midland Odessa acutes in, in Southeastern New Mexico as well. Uh, she and her team provide services in the area at Medical Center Hospital, Midland Memorial Hospital and Continue Care Hospital. Um, Cindy says a line from the song Bob Marley keeps her going during this pandemic. <laughs> and that, that line goes, don't worry about a thing because everything's going to be all right. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that, Cindy. And we're glad you're here. Um, so what I'd like to do is kind of kick off um, this, this, this question and answer discussion with basically, uh, if y'all could just kind of jump in and, and kind of help us understand how does COVID affect the kidneys? So a very important question that you asked, Pat, you know, um, COVID affecting the kidneys, there are several theories, but we don't know exactly what the mechanisms may be, but there's some speculations about the theories. And one of the theory is that the COVID, the virus actually may produce some sort of proteins inside the system, which have a reaction onto the kidneys causing a sort of a damage on the structure of the kidneys, okay? Even if they don't have any other symptoms of uh, COVID, such as a lung infection, which is commonly known, even without that, kidneys can itself isolated, be damaged with that. However, if the infection gets worse, such as affecting the lungs or affecting the heart, then the, system, the effects can be much worse, especially because the blood pressure going down or the oxygen supply being depleted to the kidneys that can have a much more severe effect on the kidneys causing even further damage and even a total shutdown. So uh, help us understand too, because uh, Anand, we were talking earlier, um, it's, it's important to know that, that, you know, you hear kidney patients, but, but there's different types of kidney patients, I guess. And, 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 and I guess as a result, this virus affects them quite differently. Help us understand that. So, so, so the, the nephrologist, what we do is we look at uh, different kinds of kidney patients. One is pre-existing kidney disease. They're called chronic kidney disease. That means they have kidney disease because of their diabetes or hypertension or any other reason. They've been called chronic kidney disease. They're a group of patients who are kidneys are slow, but not to the verge of dialysis. They've been following with a nephrologist. They can get COVID. Or patients who are already on dialysis, what we call end-stage kidney disease. They're already on dialysis. They need to be receiving three times dialysis. 
either in the center, they go three times a week, or they can get peritoneal dialysis where they do dialysis on their own at home. So the other group of patients are kidney disease who are already on dialysis who received a transplant. Now they have a transplanted kidneys. Those who are on anti-rejection medications where Dr. Alam and his expertise comes in. Um, that's a group of patients where uh, uh, they're on anti-rejection medication. They are prone for COVID. In addition, the, the last one is the one who developed the uh, kidney failure, like Dr. Ansari was mentioning, while they are affected with COVID or they are in the hospital for any other reason, which affected their kidney also due to drop in blood pressure, due to the toxins, some of the medications can react badly with the kidneys and they can, kidneys can go down to the verge that they may need temporary dialysis to salvage them or save them until their kidneys recover. So these are the four different kinds of patients that we see. So we are one of the unique specializations that we are the bridge to the outpatient to the inpatient. When the critical care doctors, they work only inside the hospitals in the ICU setting. As a nephrologist, you are seeing the walking in patient in your office who are having some chronic kidney disease, who have a COVID, to somebody who's in the ICU on a ventilator requiring uh, multiple uh, life-saving measures um, with a kidney failure. So we, we bridge this gap from the simple outpatient to the acute inpatient ICU settings. Okay. Um so we had an interesting question uh, that was just submitted. Uh, Dr. Jadam Naidu um, is, is, is watching and he, and he wants to know if there's been any, any biopsies done on, on COVID kidney and uh, that have produced any kind of specific findings. Have you all heard of any? So, yes, so yes. You want to yeah, so there have been biopsies, some small studies, but uh, relevant, showing that there's a particular type of injury which can be noted in the kidneys when they do the biopsies. Sometimes they even find uh, viral molecules inside the kidney biopsy. And uh, the term, the medical jargon is collapsing the glomerular nephritis that they have found. So yeah, most of the- add on, most common, biopsy finding was what we call ATN, acute tubular necrosis. Uh, that is a condition where patient is critically ill with hypotension or severe COVID disease when their blood pressure drops. And uh, when the blood pressure drops, there is not enough blood supply or oxygen supply to the kidneys. And uh, that can lead to this condition There is damage to the kidney tubules called ATN. And there are several other series that also, uh, like Dr. Ansari mentioned, collapsing um, uh, glomerulopathy. And there are also other changes that were seen, different uh, glomerulonephritis syndromes were reported. Uh, again, triggering potentially some immune response uh, on the kidneys that can cause inflammatory condition in the kidneys, causing kidneys to fail. Okay. So uh, in addition, I just want to add one thing. COVID, the most important, the sickest of the sick, what they develop is what we call ARDS, means the lungs are not able to get enough oxygen to the body. When that happens, every organ shows damage because there is less oxygen to the organs. So either it's liver or kidney or the heart or the brain, they all have some changes suggested, uh, suggestive of decreased oxygen supply which uh, Dr. Alam was mentioning, acute tubular necrosis. So here is the biggest problem with doing biopsy, Pat. Initially, when this uh, COVID came, they came in huge numbers. Then having to protect the whole, the biopsies are done in a, in a setting of an interventional radiologist able to go and get a piece of the kidney. Just imagining these acutely sick patients who are uh, critically ill on the maximum support of a ventilator to be able to do that was very difficult. Some of the series were uh, biopsies, some of them were uh, autopsy series. When the patient passes away, that's when they looked at some of these studies. But it, it's, it's locally we did not do because uh, it does not change the way we treat to specifically to Dr. Naidu's question. Uh, one of the uh, hindrances is how will we change uh, management? We are already giving massive doses of steroids. Um, if there is an immune response, that should take care of it. And uh, we will do the supportive therapy as 
any other medical condition. So it's uh, unlikely to change our management. And the difficulty of arranging a biopsy with a COVID positive when they're actively shedding virus, uh, being on a life support is very, very, very difficult. Have mm -hmm. you tried anything, Dr. Alam, in uh, Fort Worth? I mean, most of the population I take care of is a transplant population. The one worry we always have for transplant patients is rejection, you know, which can happen, especially if we're trying to manage patient with uh, COVID, transplant recipient with active severe COVID disease, we try to back off some on immunosuppression. Uh, we try to stop at least one or two of their rejection medicines to help them fight COVID disease. And uh, that helps the patient's overall condition potentially, but again, we are putting the kidney at the risk of rejection because our immune system is always trying to reject the kidney. These transplant recipients have to take transplant medications on a regular basis without missing any doses. So when you have a COVID-19 patient severely sick and uh, you have to back off some immunosuppressive medications so that their immune system can be a little bit more active to fight the COVID-19, we always worry about rejection. And uh, doing a biopsy um, in, in this critically ill population with positive COVID, again, that puts other um, healthcare providers at risk of acquiring COVID-19. So unless, as Dr. Reddy mentioned, unless it changes the management, um, we uh, would try to avoid doing biopsies. In the transplantation, there is a new technology that is becoming available recently, is something called cell-free DNA. Uh, that is a blood test uh, based on which we can tell if there is the kidney that is being rejected. So I have done that blood test, cell-free DNA test, uh, to find out if there is any rejection going on, but we try not to do the biopsies as much as possible unless we feel that it is going to change management in a big way. So um, I have a two part question or two questions. Uh, and one is help people understand, does having kidney disease put you at risk of getting COVID? Or is it just, you know, or once having kidney disease makes it worse if you get it? That's the first question. Does having kidney disease put you at risk of getting COVID? And then as a follow-up, uh, Dr. Naidu says, asks, what percentage, what percentage of COVID patients wind up developing, you know, kidney issues? So to answer the first question, um, there's, again, as we, we just talked about, there's several types of kidney disease patients. You know, one is what is called as a chronic kidney disease. The other one is end-stage renal failure. Other one is the transplant kidney. Now, when you have a chronic kidney disease, there's nothing in the chronic kidney disease which makes you more susceptible to have an infection with COVID. However, when generally when people have chronic kidney disease or patients have chronic kidney disease, they also have other conditions such as diabetes or other illnesses which make them predisposed or increase the infection rate, get a COVID. And when they do get an infection with COVID, there's a chance that it could get worse compared to somebody who did not have a kidney problem. And sure enough, people with end-stage kidney disease or transplanted kidneys are at a risk of getting infection because the immunity would be considered to be lower than the general population. And to answer the second question, uh, um, do these patients who, uh, how many of the patients have COVID develop kidney problem, especially in patients who have a severe illness and who have been admitted to the hospital, we see almost 30 to 50% of these patients will develop a kidney failure. And we also see that, especially if, uh, if they're intubated on a ventilator, we see, and they have a kidney problem or kidney failure, we see the chances of them surviving are much lesser compared to the other folks who don't have a kidney problem. So yes, the combination of having COVID and kidney failure and being admitted to the hospital is bad news. So uh, just quickly to add to this, for all the people coming in contact with the COVID is a risk factor. That means wearing a mask does work. So even if you have a pre-existing pre kidney disease, that does not make you susceptible to get a COVID. Once you get a COVID, they can have a severe infection compared to the general population with no other medical problems. Okay. So 
let's talk about, you know, um, your kidney patient, you get COVID, you start going downhill and you, and you wind up in the hospital. Uh, and that's where Cindy, you and Sylvia come in. Uh, you spend a lot of time with these, with these very sick patients. And what I'd like for you all, each of you to do is kind of walk us through what your, what your typical day is like and, and, and how has it changed? What's different about a typical day now in this pandemic versus what a typical day was like before? Well, the, now that this COVID situation going on, we find ourselves um, having a lot more patients to take care of. We have been putting in extremely long hours where before we would only work like eight to 12 hours a day, we'd actually have our scheduled days off. And now you have, um, you're lucky if you can have a day off because you're trying to, to take care of all the patients that, that need the dialysis now. So there's a big influx in them. The patients are a lot more critical than before. A lot of times you would just get like chronic patients who were in for a procedure and needed dialysis while they were in the hospital. Now we're, we're taking care of patients that we, we it's first time dialysis, what we call the acute patients. And it's nonstop. It's one after the other. And we just never know. We may just say, okay, we have so many patients today. And they come in through the ER constantly and needing dialysis treatment. So it's actually made our days very long. And uh, of course, being shorthanded with all the nurses, we don't have enough staff as dialysis nurses. So it's making it really hard for us. I wanted to add to that one, um, Sylvia. I, I do agree that it's hard. We only have just within our fingers uh, our staff, exactly. and compared to the hospitals, we don't we don't get FEMA support. So first started, the um, majority of our patients were acutely ill patients, and with ER diversion. Um, there, there was actually a big decrease in the number of dialysis patients in house. So later on during the summer, um, there was it started going up, and you know we just have to deal with it day by day. Um, yeah, we have to stay long hours. You know the hospital setting, we have to make sure that we have enough equipment, we have enough ports, we have enough. You know we we have to move around when the, the this suite is filling up to the hospital will start opening a new bay and you know they're just opening one floor to the other until we have coordinated with the hospital and the hospital was able to provide us a suite it's our in our suite that they were able to put in a negative air where we can do multi-treatments as before, our setup was um, we're only doing one on one. So, you know, if we have five COVID patients, let's say 10 COVID patients, and we only have very many staff, that eats up the time of our staff. And, you know, having to have a suite, it's a lot easier when we can do multi treatments. I believe in the original, you can do multi um, ICU treatments. I think I'm seeing your set up there, Sylvia. Yeah, well, the way that it's set up is it's like one big bay area. So, you know, where before we would only run one CCU patient at a time, we're actually running two patients that could be intubated at one time, which makes it kind of hard. Um, but the, the support you have from all of the nurses in these hospitals has been amazing. I have. I feel like I everybody has come together to to save these patients and to work really hard, and we all just have that one goal in in common is is to do what we can for these patients and try to save them and try to communicate with the families, let them you know keep them updated on how everything is going. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, sometimes it's not always good, but we try our hardest to to you know, be positive about it and go throughout our day with the patients. Well, I, I guess it's, it's got to be uh, really trying on you all emotionally because, I mean, pre-COVID, you're, you're dealing with dialysis patients or kidney patients and you're helping them, you know, you're helping them live with the disease. Uh, but with COVID, it's, it's you're, you're, 
you're dealing with a lot of patients you, that, that wind up dying from it. And I think yes. that's, that's really, it's got to be hard. I mean, because I think, you know, I think Dr. Reddy, you mentioned one time, you, you know, you wake up in the morning and you look at your board and two or three patients that were there the night before are not there anymore. And uh, exactly. how do you all handle that, that, that grief and, and the stress? You know, it, it's just have... go ahead, Cindy. It's it's hard. I actually have witnessed, you know, a few of them. The most recent one was you know, I was watching the secretary, the unit secretary in CTU, accompanying and helping two relatives of a family member, a family member of a patient not doing too good, and I think have come up to the point of making a decision that this is it, we cannot let her go. So it was hard watching them. I actually talked to the CCU charge nurse at that time. I was like, and I just ended up just having tears in my eyes, but you know, we have to support them. We need to be there for them. Um, it's hard. It's actually challenging <laughs> these days to watch, to watch those difficult times. Um, we you know, have to just deal with it every day and just comfort them. Unfortunately, um, we haven't, I haven't had to deal much with the family personally. Um, I know that the nurses and the charge nurses do that part, but as a dialysis nurse, you know, we're trying our hardest to, to save their lives. And I've actually um, had all just the patients pass away like right next to me or right after dialysis or just like we have to stop the treatment because they're not tolerating it and then you see them pass and it's just so heartbreaking and um I myself I've had to to walk out of the unit you know excuse myself walk out to the unit and I just break down in the in the stairwell it's that sad and have to take a deep breath deep breath (laughs) Yes, take a deep breath. And like I said, I'm, I have texted Dr. And Dr. Reddy and said, I can't, uh, it's hard. I said, I'm having an emotional breakdown. I said, you know, this is getting too hard. And it's like he says, we have to keep on going for the ones who still need us. You know, um, we're very limited with dialysis nurses. So we have to just keep on going and you know, just take a deep breath and say, okay, the next patient you know, we can probably, we can try our hardest to save that next patient. Right. Well, and when you say keep on going and you talk about long hours, um, yes. I think, you know, you help people understand what long hours are. I understand there was a case recently where you didn't get home until what, three in the morning, and then you got a call and had to be back at seven. Uh, yes. Yes. There's been days we go in at seven in the morning, six, seven in the morning to get going. And like I say, this is where they, we get the sick patients coming in through the ER and they, you know, we have to dialyze them and we stay there until the work is done. We try to get every patient that, that, you know, comes in that the doctors say that needs dialysis. So I think the longest day that I've worked is like 22 hours in one day. And it makes it really hard when you have to come home, take a, a short nap and then get back up and go back to work. Wow. It, it's it's and then you're you're emotionally drained and then just physically tired but but you you got to do it you mm-hmm. know you have to do it for the patient's sake it's amazing um so let, let's get technical real quick because i had another question from dr naidu uh when we're talking about dialysis um what are what are y'all finding is is the better treatment uh is uh, peritoneal dialysis or uh Hemo, hemodialysis uh, for end-stage COVID kidney uh, situations. Uh, what's working better, do you think? And, and explain the difference between the two. So, so the, uh, what Dr. Naidu is mentioning is people who are already um, as end-stage kidney disease, that means they have been supported, life supported with either uh, hemodialysis where they go to the dialysis unit three times a week. Each time is four hours or one who's doing at home through his uh, belly, that's called peritoneal dialysis every night. In fact, we had patients of both kinds who come into the hospital, both have done reasonably well. 
um, the, the, the worst ones we worry about are the ones uh, our nurses are having difficulty also is the ones who had uh, lungs not responding to the ventilators. They are on maximum support for the ventilator. When to open up the lung, they give what they call positive pressure ventilation. They try to blow the oxygen into the lungs. When they do that, the blood pressure tags, blood pressure drops very, very low. In those kind of patients, trying to do dialysis, they're so sensitive and even connecting to the machine within minutes, they start uh, dropping blood pressures, not able to tolerate it. That's what our nurses are mentioning about not tolerating. There are instances where um, is a 35 year old mom uh, with a four year old kid and you are trying everything you can and they are not tolerating the dialysis. Those are the kind of situations where you try everything that we know trying to see uh, if we can adjust the machines, adjust the dialysis, trying to uh, work around with a lot of different medications, see if they can tolerate. Um, those are the patients who do not tolerate dialysis, but those who are already at dialysis, we had a reasonable, decent success with those patients, able to tolerate and able to come out of the ventilators. Um, that, that, that's the difficult one. When, the, when they talk about uh, nursing, we all think as 12-hour shifts. One of the biggest things I need, I wanted to say is these unsung heroes. The dialysis nursing is probably the only nursing which does not have 12-hour shifts. I don't, we don't thank them enough. And this is my opportunity to say thank you to them. You know, they, they are the ones who work. Uh, there is no time gap. Like, um, like she said, 22 hours in a day. That's, it, that's humanly impossible to put in day in, day out. Um, this takes a toll on these nurses. And dialysis nursing is a extra training. It's not just the regular uh, nursing. Plus they need a special training for almost six months. So to get new dialysis nurses, we're having issues because everywhere across the country is the same situation. It's not like there's somebody sitting in Houston, you can just ask them to come over here. Uh, we do not have that opportunity across the country, um, there have been uh, same, same in New York, same in uh, Dallas area, same in here locally. Um, whatever resources we have, we have to protect them and uh, nurture them. Well, and, and there's also, I mean, uh, you're talking about staffing, uh, you know, Cindy, Sylvia, have you all had colleagues? I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that y'all had to deal with infections too in your teams. Uh, yes. That's, I, I think that's, so then, then you you know you're even more shorthanded. But then you also have to worry about your friends and colleagues, you know, struggling with the illness. And it, yes, it, you know we're a um, we're just a small group of of nurses, and we cover three facilities. Um, we cover, like I say, Midland Memorial, ORMC, and Encompass Health, and it's just four of us nurses it, with our group. And before COVID, we were able to handle it. You know, it was it was doable. And now with the COVID situation, it's been extremely hard. So all of us have been working anywhere between 60, 80, 90 hours a week. And it, you know, it brings your immune system down when you work so much and you're tired. So we actually did have a pay, one of our nurses that that got infected with the COVID virus. Um, fortunately, he's he's doing well and should be back to work soon. But you do, you're constantly worrying about him or about your, your teammates and trying to see how else you can help each other out, you know, and, and you're constantly texting or calling to, to check up on them, make sure that him and the family is okay. So that's another thing that you have on the back of your mind. Oh my gosh, you know, I hope he, he's good and I hope that everything turns out okay. And I'm yeah. luckily he is, yeah. So we'll be getting that's, him back soon. That's good. Yeah. Um, with my program, there's more than there's more of us. There's around ten of us, uh, but we cover medical center, so that's the biggest in the area. And the good part is, um, you know, not all of them are wishing, you know, two or three of them to get sick because I don't know. Right. Right. So yeah, one one at a time. We actually have three staff now who got infected, but actually the third one is coming back tomorrow. He's completely to go back to work. But I think the big part is uh, the 
know, it's it will come from the staff. We can only remind them do it strict precaution. You need to wear your PP. You need to wear your goggles. Your N95 is only good for this long. Um, you know, if uh, you know you have to change scrubs every time you dress and make sure that when you go home, you're only wearing a washer and go take a shower because we don't want our family members to get sick and get COVID. So. Yeah, th those reminders and the staff themselves, you know, you can, you can only remind them that the staff themselves has to comply, otherwise they're all going to get sick. That's yeah. going to be very scary. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, let's talk about um, the transplant side of it, um, because this, this, this pandemic has had to have had a, an, a, a, just a horrible effect and presented a totally different set of challenges to uh, doctors such as you, Dr. Alam, and, and transplant patients and the whole process of transplanting. Um, help us understand how this, this COVID-19 pandemic has, has affected transplants. Sure, Pat. So transplant, you know, people, there are two kinds of transplant uh, populations we deal with. One uh, a group is patients that are waiting for transplant. So they have end stage kidney failure, they have liver failure, they have heart failure that need a life-saving transplant. And the second group of patients we address or we help with are the patients that received transplant in the past. So COVID-19 pandemic has affected both groups in a significant proportion, in significant impact on both groups of populations. You know, for most of the programs, uh, transplant programs, when uh, the pandemic evolved. Uh, we don't know how it is going to impact. We hear from the news from abroad, from uh, early uh, in the pandemic in US, from um, uh, Seattle area, from New York area. We have been um, been updated on a regular basis. I mean, this is a deadly pandemic with so much mortality rate. So all the transplant programs um, for at least a couple of months or so, they stopped doing transplants, you know, especially living donor transplants. That means the patients that are waiting for a life-saving transplant, and when the programs have stopped doing transplants, you know, they are not going to receive transplant. That means, you know, they are facing higher mortality risk, higher risk of death while waiting for transplant during this, you know, lockdown situation. And post-transplant, uh, that's another population we deal with, you know, after transplant to prevent uh, rejection of the transplanted organs, these patients are uh, receiving anti-rejection medications. And obviously the, the way they work is by suppressing the immune system so that your immune system doesn't fight the organ that is transplanted. Uh, so any infections, um, uh, not only the antibiotics um, uh, that we typically help patients uh, with, uh, our immune system also has to cooperate and help fight the infection. So when you're suppressing the immune system with these rejection medicines, so any disease, any infection can get very severe uh, in transplant recipients. So the studies um, have shown transplant patients up to 40% of them uh, die with COVID-19, getting very severe, especially if they're a recent transplant recipient, uh, having been exposed to higher dose of rejection medicines, uh, they are at very high risk of dying from COVID-19. So that's how I mean, transplant patients uh, are affected both pre-transplant, I mean, their opportunity to get transplant is being lowered from COVID-19 with the transplant programs taking a pause and trying to assess the situation post-transplant. Um, you know, they are at risk of um, uh, uh, getting disease much severe to cause, um, you know, increased risk of death. So they, yeah, if they, if they have COVID, they have to go off the anti-rejection medication, which then, so, so what is, kind of help us understand, what's the percentage the, the, the survival rate of transplant patients generally, and so you're saying 40% of transplant patients with COVID wind up dying. Uh, normally, you know, what, what's, what's the survival rate, rate for your normal transplant patient? So if, for kidney transplant patients, for example, uh, one year survival rates are about uh, 95%, so less than 5% die every year. Uh, so, 
uh, with COVID-19 initial series, especially patients that got transplanted in the recent past, uh, they are at significantly higher risk up to 40% according to the initial series coming out of New York. And as the pandemic evolved, as we understood the, the virus better, and as at least some treatments that became available, as we understood this disease better, we are currently seeing uh, close to 10 to 15%, even some series um, are, were reporting less than 10% mortality currently in the transplant recipients. So this kind of, oh, go ahead, Dr. Reddy. Sorry, I just want to add to one, one more collateral damage that we see very particular to West Texas. In the past, whenever we had a liver failure who's, who needs a liver transplant, it was a simple phone call to Fort Worth or mm -hmm. um, just call them and they take the patient, which was very, very easy. Now with the COVID overwhelming the system, the uh, transfers are not happening. So we are losing those patients because of the uh, overwhelming COVID admissions in the area. Wow. Well, I, I guess, I have a, this is kind of a personal question for you, Dr. Alam. Um, how, how does it make you feel as, as a transplant surgeon? Uh, because I mean, you're all about, you know, giving them a second chance of life. You know, you, you have the donor, you have, and, and, you know, you do the transplant and it's gotta be a, a very rewarding feeling. And, and then to have something like this virus come along and, and kind of basically pull the rug out from under this second chance of life that, you know, that has such a high survivable rate. Um, how does that make you feel uh, frustrated or? It is, I mean, very devastating. I mean, as at a personal level, as well as I my mean, transplant teams, I mean, I think COVID-19 brought all the medical teams together as a team and transplant teams generally operate as a team. I mean, you have transplant surgeons, transplant nephrologists, transplant nurses, transplant mm -hmm. social worker, uh, it has tremendously affected uh, them. Uh, you know, this is a very highly motivated team that's always out there to make a difference in others' lives by giving them a second chance. And it affected in a way that we were not able to do as much as it is uh, um, before COVID-19 and then see them die uh, post-transplant. Uh, even we have seen you know, even some younger patients, some typically, I mean, COVID-19, uh, older patients, diabetics, transplant recipients, you know, there are some established risk factors that, um, that are at, um, that put each particular patient at a high risk of dying from COVID-19. Um, but we have seen a small number of younger patients also that really succumb to COVID-19. That is really heartbreaking to the transplant teams and everybody on the team that is taking care of these patients that have seen them before transplant that have made them go through the transplant process, which is not an easy process. It is tedious process that would take a few months for them to get uh, everything in order for them to go through transplant and then catch this virus and then uh, not able to make it. Uh, it is really uh, astounding and um, and we never anticipated something like this we would ever see in, in our lifetime. We, we heard about, I mean, swine flu more than 100 years ago that kind of affected the whole world. Uh, but this is something that, you know, in our careers, we never seen or heard that. I mean, this is something um, mind blowing that, I mean, we had gone through in the last several months. Right. Um, we, we've had another question come up from a, a viewer. Uh, you know, uh, in the last year or two, the, there's been the, 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 the news that there's a, another strain coming out of, I guess it's the UK. Um, can y'all talk about that? I know there are questions about, you know, is the, the how, kind of how um, contagious it is. It's, there's questions of it's more virulent uh, or there's also worries, I think some people that, well, this, this may, you know, if I get inoculated against the current virus, this strain may make that a whole mood issue. Can, can you all speak to any of that? We don't have complete information about the new strain and there's no, I don't think there's any documented cases of the new strain in America mainland. But one thing reassuringly that has been published recently was Pfizer and the Moderna va vaccine. They are saying that the new strain should be covered under the vaccine. Okay. Anything else you have heard, Anand? 
No, uh, the, the, they are looking at uh, this now. Um, they are very positive that it should cover because they're thinking it's a spike protein that uh, already been vaccinated against. Uh, but they're going to do a lot of trials now. They're going to start looking into this population and see if uh, it's, uh, it's, it's going to work. Um, generally, by knowing the flu uh, vaccinations over the many years, even though it may not completely cover, but at least it reduces or dampens the effect of severe uh, condition. At least uh, we hope uh, the Pfizer and Moderna will have the same effect on this uh, uh, new mutant. But at least for now, this vaccine should cover most of the mutants, uh, mu uh, most of the mutations that's there in uh, the US. Okay, so, so Dr. Alam, talk about the vaccine as far as with transplant recipients. Uh, is it, it, are they recommended to receive it? Also, did they, were any transplant patients as part of the, the blind studies? Could you talk some more about that? Sure, currently, as you all know, I mean, there are two vaccinations that are approved uh, under Emergency Act by FDA. One is from Pfizer, other one is from Moderna uh, over the last week or so. And uh, both are not live vaccines. So transplant patients um, cannot receive live vaccines because they have suppressed immune system, the li uh, live vaccine and make them develop disease. So th both these vaccines are not live vaccines. So we do not have any transplant recipients in these vaccine trials. Uh, so, but based on our experience with similar uh, vaccines in, in flu, for, for example, for influenza, so these vaccines are theoretically safe in transplant recipients. And so, because they're not live vaccines, they're against uh, the spike protein of the COVID-19 virus particle. Uh, so you develop immune system, uh, immune antibodies against this spike protein uh, component of this virus. Uh, so being a transplant recipient because of your immune system is not as strong as the general population, um, you may not respond as much as general population. These two vaccines that are currently approved, uh, they're about 95% effective. That means in general populations, about 95% of uh, the population that receive these vaccines develop protective antibodies if they encounter the virus they're not going to develop this uh, disease. Or even if they develop uh, uh, acquire COVID-19, they're not going to have a severe infection compared to the person that did not have vaccination done. Mm -hmm. So transplant recipients are safe to receive these vaccines. Now, they may not respond as robust as the general populations. So the current guidelines, again, with the data that is available, which is not much, but based on our experience with similar vaccines for other viruses in the past, uh, the recommendation is to receive, go ahead and receive these vaccines as long as you are at least a month post-transplant. If you're at least a month since you received a transplant, you should go and get these vaccinations done. And you still have to uh, uh, follow the precautions of um, uh, uh, wearing a mask, following social distancing. And uh, so that is the current recommendation uh, for transplant recipients. One of our viewers asked a follow-up question, uh, Dr. Alam. She wants to know, are there any plans to develop new policies that will help patients that are still interested in transplant, although the mortality rate you know, with, with COVID is high? Yes, I mean, so right now for life-saving transplants, for example, a liver transplant or heart transplant, you know, there, there is no pause for those transplants because, you know, for, for example, for patients with end-stage kidney disease um, that are in need of a kidney transplant, it's okay for them to wait a little bit longer because they have dialysis option. Mm -hmm. So they can go on for some time without transplant, whereas for the liver failure, for heart failure, there's no such, you know, uh, definitive therapy or bridge therapy until they get transplant. So for life-saving life transplants, all the transplant programs have resumed doing transplants like before. And uh, for kidney transplant recipients um, that still want to proceed with transplantation, again, and if you miss an opportunity, you never know when you're going to receive next transplant offer, unless you have a living donor, one of your family members or friends that are willing to donate a kidney, and then you can wait in that situation for a few months until this COVID surge uh, subsides. Uh, for kidney transplant recipients, what we have been doing uh, is, you know, not give as much immunosuppressive medications as before the pandemic. So we have been a little bit more uh, 
um, on the conservative side, trying not to immunosuppress too much so that we don't put them at risk of I mean, developing severe disease if they were to catch the infection post-transplant out there in the community. And we always tell them, even, you know, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we always tell our transplant recipients for first few weeks, don't go out anywhere, limit yourself to home and your trusted ones, your trusted family members and your visit should be just to the transplant clinic. Right. Uh, so we, we always, I mean, are tuned to tell these transplant recipients, even before this, to be very cautious. I mean, we always warn them about their suppressed immune system to avoid the crowds, to limit the number of visitors. So that has become more relevant with this COVID-19. And uh, since the COVID-19 has um, evolved, uh, uh, we did about uh, 90 kidney transplants in our program. And um, by God's grace, none of them got infected uh, immediately after the transplant. The, um, we took care of several transplant recipients that had COVID-19, but most of them turned out to be the transplant recipients from uh, a year ago or three years ago or many years ago. Uh, by God's grace, we did not have um, any of our fresh transplant recipients that we did since this COVID-19 pandemic evolved um, that had caught COVID-19. Again, reinforcing, I mean, even before any therapy became available, reinforcing, I mean, the good practices like, you know, face masking, social distancing, keeping your activities to the minimum, keeping going out to the minimum. And all those things did really help so that, I mean, uh, we didn't have to see any fresh patients uh, acquire this disease. Okay. Um we have another a question from uh, a Dr. Ronan uh, just sent one in and could you all please discuss uh, some of the, we've talked about some of the, the you know, the, the issues with COVID and the way it affects the kidneys. He'd like to know though, if we could uh, discuss some of the renal nuances of the disease of the COVID-19 disease that you've seen. So, so once again, we are back uh, back to the same uh, issue of uh, the kidneys that uh, we were mentioning earlier, the different biopsy findings mm -hmm. um, that COVID can uh, either have a direct effect on the kidney or an indirect effect. Indirect means when it causes multi-organ failure. When it causes multi-organ failure, when the lungs are badly affected, those are the patients when, um, when they release a lot of cytokines where it affects all organs of the system, including kidneys, are the direct effect on the kidneys where pa patient may be reasonably okay with the COVID, but his kidneys are worsening. He starts spilling a lot of protein or he's uh, having a worsening kidney function, but his lungs are reasonably okay and he's recovering uh, COVID-wise. So those are the group of patients where you can find uh, different kind of kidney diseases. And the other uh, area is the uh, unfortunately, our dialysis patients, um, uh, we try to keep them uh, social distance in the dialysis unit. Dialysis unit is like a three feet apart, two patients receiving dialysis. Right. At any given time, there's anywhere from 12 to 18 or uh, 20 patients at a time receiving dialysis. So maintaining a social distancing and masking is very, very tough considering some of them are very old. Some of them have confusions, dementia. So it, it is a big, big task, which we are reasonably well controlled in our area over the last uh, six months. It's still, it's, it's one of the uh, difficult situations as outpatient dialysis to provide dialysis on a date uh, every other day. When everything was locked down, dialysis uh, units were not. We were doing the same what we did for the last uh, many years. There's no change. Actually, in fact, the work has increased. We started uh, isolating the patients who are positive and keeping them in a different shift, um, a different staff for that, dedicated uh, units for that. Um, so we, we dedicated ourselves a unit in Midland where all the patients from uh, what is some Midland for uh, where we work, me and Dr. Ansari, we shifted them to one dialysis unit in Midland to be able to isolate them. So those are the kind of nuances with uh, kidney diseases. Okay. Um, it looks like we're, we're, we're getting ready to come up on the, the bewitching hour where we're gonna probably need to wrap this up. But what I'd like to do is kind of go around and um, 
kind of get your closing thoughts from each of you um, that, that we can take away from this. Um, we'll start with, how about ladies first, Sylvia? Well, um, I just want to say that the dialysis patients right now, the, the, the chronic ones are immuno, immunocompromised and they depend a lot on their families to, to take them to dialysis, you know, they're just the support system. And I've seen uh, a lot of patients that are having to be singled out now because of this COVID. Or only one family member is is designated, you know, to take them. So I've seen a lot of the patients that are getting kind of depressed about it because um, they feel, you know, I'm just separated from everybody else. Um, so I really encourage everybody, please. I mean, wear your masks, wash your hands, and don't leave your house if you don't need to. Um, there's other people that that are that are sick that can. Even if it's not them that are out, just their, their providers or anybody that, that's close to them that can get sick and get them sick. So it's really, really critical um, for everybody to be wearing a mask and to take all these safe precautions. Good, good point. Cindy, what about you? Yeah, um, so after Thanksgiving, here comes the holidays. There's still Christmas <laughs> later this week and New Year, the next week. So after Thanksgiving, our census actually, we had the most patients that we dialyzed. A lot of patients get sick. A few of them had recovered, make it out of the hospital. A few of them died, we didn't make it out. So now that here comes the vaccine. There's light at the end of the tunnel. So guys, um, if vaccine it will add in our protection, it will be our support shield. As we were telling Dr. Reddy the other day that we have our mask, or goggles, or face shield, you know, your scrubs, and then just the vaccines. But for you guys, wear your mask, please, hand hygiene, and don't go outside. Avoid the parties for now. It will be a little sacrifice. This year may be different. Maybe we can celebrate it first of if you really need to. But yeah, just a little sacrifice this year and, and do what we're supposed to. And yeah, we'll get through this together. And this will end soon. Thank you, Cindy. Dr. Alam? Uh, I would say, I mean, I would echo with what Sylvia and Cindy mentioned. Um, you know, I took care of several COVID-19 patients, you know, taking all the precautions, you know, is the, is the key. Even though I came in close encounter and cared for these patients, I did not catch COVID-19 myself. Mm -hmm. So that speaks of the importance of um, taking all the precautions, masking, washing hands, maintaining the distance as much as you could. So this is the year that I want all the viewers and everybody in the community to be watchful, follow all the precautions. And, uh, and uh, you know, this is the year to be safe. I mean, this is the holiday season to be safe, not celebrate. I mean, this is the year that we have to sacrifice um, for the well-being of ourselves, our loved ones, um, as well as our communities. Uh, so take all the precautions and um, uh, be safe and uh, as soon as the vaccination becomes available, uh, please go ahead and get the vaccine. I got my vaccine last week, a week ago. I think all the panelists on the on the meeting. Has everyone got their vaccines, right? Yes. Cindy, do you have your Band-Aid? You got yours today? <laughs> yes, I got the vaccine a week ago, so I didn't have any problem. And most vaccine recipients do okay. I mean, there may be occasional reactions. If you have prior reaction to any vaccine, you may be able to wait and watch, but everybody should get vaccination as soon as it is available in the community. That's a great point. Dr. Ansari. I mean, I would like to echo everybody else uh, about the precautions, but personally, I felt the majority of this year was very emotional and very frustrating. And I think almost every physician will agree with me. I have not seen as much death as I saw in this short span of time the density of death. Uh, mm -hmm. And I wish I never have to deal with this sort of a phase ever in my life. And um, so to do that, I think we should get vaccinated uh, at least against this pandemic and take the necessary precautions. Good point. Dr. Reddy? So uh, I echo what uh, everyone else said. One more uh, thing is we call ourselves uh, romantic physicians, the nephrologists, because we, we follow these <laughs> patients forever. We know some of my dialysis patients have been with me for eight years, nine years, 10 years. 
the nurses are also emotionally attached to them they see them every time they come to the hospital they know their families uh, from uh, six months back to now they come and share their news oh i had a grandbaby my grandbaby got married there are so many emotions that goes through them I always keep telling them there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Just wait one more month. We have a vaccine available. So close. Yeah. Uh, just wait another one month. We are so close to the victory. We can uh, get the vaccine and at least win this battle. And some of them can get a transplant and live longer. Um, it, it, it is frustrating for somebody to get sick now and not get better, um, especially when the vaccine is so close. So this is the next one month is most critical. Um, the vaccines are rolling out. I'm sure uh, within the next one month, we'll have plenty of vaccines available to the community, especially our dialysis and uh, uh, kidney disease patients. Um, we, and the transplant patients, we are expecting uh, to be available very, very pretty soon. That's great. Yeah. Uh, okay, so before we wrap it up, um, I'm Cindy, you and Sylvia got your shot in the arm, but today, but I'm going to give you another shot in the arm. Uh, there's some some really neat comments from some of our viewers I want to share with you. Shannon uh, Janicek said, nurses give a face to the humanity of all of this. Not too many of us could tolerate this. Uh, thank you to you all. And another comment from Texas Tech Permian Basin IMRP. Uh, thank you to our renal teams in Midland, Odessa. And then Rosie Davila said, I worked dialysis for six months, many years ago. Toughest, most physically demanding nursing job ever. God bless you guys, thank you. So I just wanted to share that with y'all and also to say thank you uh, to each and every one of y'all who participated tonight on this. Dr. Reddy, Dr. Alam, Dr. Ansari, uh, Cindy, Sylvia, we really appreciate it. Um, y'all really have, you know, y'all really have borne uh, uh, the brunt of, of a lot of this pandemic as far as the kind of the way it affects people. And y'all have worked so hard to, to care for these people. And, um, you know, we can't thank you enough. And we can't thank you enough for taking the time tonight to kind of help us better understand your perspectives and what you have to deal with and how you help these people. So thank you very much. And I'm going to toss it back to you, Robbie. Uh, thank you. Pat, uh, first of all, thank you for moderating an excellent discussion. It's a very valuable communication for the community. And I do want to also thank you, Dr. Reddy, Dr. Ansari, Dr. Alam, and Cindy and Sylvia. Uh, our heartfelt thanks for all of you, for all the work you do. And we will be recording this and we'll be placing this on the Facebook and YouTube channel for later viewing. And we will also be sharing this with the ECSD students in their own system. So your knowledge and the thoughts and everything what you shared is very valuable. And we would like to thank you for that. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You.